Hello and welcome to this video and this video is going to be called What Makes a Drummer Great? And uh, also, you know, underlying that, what makes any musician great? Is there a difference between a great musician and a good musician? Right? Well, maybe I have to uh, define the terms, you know, good and great. Um, good in terms of music could be seen as functionally working, you know, um, being pleasant to listen to, you know, doing the creative things that um, you need to do to make the music sound good. What, what's greatness? Greatness um, suggests some sort of um, stamp on the music, I think, some sort of historic um, footprint that you, you um, manage to instill. You know, so Louis Armstrong is a great, he's one of the greats because of his influence and because of the sort of um, echo of what he did creatively. So, and I think when you look at the good difference between good and great, it sort of starts to um, give you an idea of what greatness is. And I think it's the balance of those two things. It's the balance of being able to functionally do what's required and put your individuality into, into that, you know. So there's millions and millions of good drummers out there because they can do the job, you know. If they need to play a Queen song, they can play it. And if you can play it and do all the stuff that um, is required to make that Queen song sound good, then you're a good drummer. Are you a great drummer though? No, because you're not really uh, showing any individuality or creative creativity, all right? Now, the other thing we need to discuss on this video is, is what specifically makes a drummer great. Now, um, in my time as a drum teacher, I've had a number of students come to me who already play drums, usually some kid who's around about 17, 18, 19, and they already play drums and they're already, already really good. And they come to me and they say, look, you know, I've been playing for a number of years, you know, I'm in a semi-pro band, I really want to go pro, I want, I want to go out and work, I want to, um, you know, have a career as a drummer. All right? And one of the things I have to do is then say to them, well, so what do you think are the attributes that are going to make you um, commercially um, needed by the music industry. What does the music industry want? You know, what are they willing to pay for? Um, you know, when they need a drummer. So obviously, the industry needs drummers. It needs drummers far less than it did thirty or forty years ago. But it still needs drummers, and we can say, so what does the industry need? And once you've decided what the industry needs and you've listed that, then you've got to go about being absolutely expert in those things, okay? Now this is quite interesting because when you look at a lot of the attributes that drummers are trying to practice, um, what they're trying to get good at, right? You start to realize that the attributes they're working on aren't the attributes on that list. So shall I start with what they tend to work on and then look at what I think the attributes are that are required to make you good, right? Yeah, let's do it that way. So what do most drummers practice? Right, I think trying to play fast. I think if when I watch drummers practicing, their overriding goal is to play faster, okay? Um, their overriding goal would to be able to play like the drummers, um, that play in the bands that they like, to be able to play the style of music that they like, okay? Um, to be able to play cliches that will make them sound like the drummers attached to the style of music they like. That's more accurate, you know? So they're, they're trying to play fast and they're trying to play cliches, all right? Um, what else do I tend to see them working on? Um, trying to be technically complex so that it shows that they've got skill, okay? So drummers often come to me and say, I, I don't know any rudiments, can you teach me some rudiments? As though that's a thing in itself that will prove they're good if they can play rudiments, all right? Now, if we take those things I've just discussed and we um, look at what you is required of a, a drummer working commercially, right? 
Does a drummer have to be able to play fast? Well, to some extent, yes, because they might be asked to play music that's fast, right? But on the whole, most music isn't unbelievably blindingly fast, right? So that as a goal is a, a particularly <laughs> stupid one to have, you know, because no one's looking for that. You know, I've, I've never gone to an audition, you know, so say somebody rings me up and there's an ABBA tribute, uh, you know, and you go along to the ABBA tribute and say, yeah, uh, you know, let's check you out and they sit you down and they go, right, first things first, how fast can you play? Because we want a drummer that can play really, really fast because no one's gonna be able to get through Dancing Queen unless they can play double bass drums at 280 BPM, you know, it's just <laughs> absolutely ridiculous, right? Um, to be able to play like the music you like. Well, obviously, if you're working commercially, you're going to have to play what the client wants you to play, right? So actually, we start to come up against a, 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 a something here, which is very important, is that you're able to play lots of different styles. You'll be able, you're able to play in lots of different situations. I think that is something that we can put on the list of what you do need to do, right? Um, I have never been to an audition where somebody says, can you play inverted paradiddle diddles or can, you know, have you got your atomy cues down at 220 BPM, right? Rudiments are my business. <laughs> if I use them, I use them. And I, I think the whole rudimental thing is a, is a bit of a joke anyway. It's turned into, a, into some sort of, you know, ruler by which we measure drum and drummers, you know, how many rudiments can you play? Everything you play on a drum kit is a rudiment, you know, um, a rock beat is a rudiment, right, right, both right, you know, that's a rudiment, you know, single stroke rolls are rudiments, you know, and every drummer plays those, so that's a bit ridiculous. Um, you should practice rudiments, I think, but you practice rudiments with a goal in mind, and that's what I'm talking about, what are the goals? What are the goals that make you a good drummer? Now, we still haven't talked about what makes you a great drummer. This is just what makes you a good drummer. Well, the first thing I think, number one, right, on the list is you need to be able to play in time, okay? If you can't play in time, you will not work. So you need to practice playing in time. You need to have good time. That means you can play to a click if needed or not play to a click. Because I've seen on forums people shouting, oh, you know, if you want to improve your time, play to a click. No, if you learn to if you practice playing to a click, you will get good at playing to a click. But what happens if there's not a click there? What if happens if you're the time? So you need to practice both, right? Now, I have a bunch of exercises that I will take one of those kids that wants to become a pro drummer, I will give them a bunch of exercises that will improve their internal time so they can play to click and they can keep time themselves. So I'm not gonna go into that there, but that's one of the skills we have to play in time. But there's something far more important than that that makes you a, um, a good drummer. And is that is that you sound good. Most of the time when you're getting hired, nowadays they're hiring a drummer because the drummer, they want the sound of a real drummer. They've already got the sound of an unreal drummer, of a computer drummer. They want a real drummer. So when they pull you in, usually I think your sound is the most important. So we, we're starting to get a set of sk skills here. You've got to be able to play in time. That means having good internal time. You're, you need to sound good. And the, 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 your sound is mostly coming from your hands and your technique. Now that readjusts what you think technique is, okay? Technique is not about you playing fast, not about you doing blast beats. It's not about you playing rudiments at a million miles an hour. Your technique is there to make you sound good. All technique on the instrument is to make you sound good, okay? So if you're in a studio and you're playing, right, and they wanna hear your snare drum backbeat is consistent, that is gonna come from your technique and it needs to be practiced. But your sound is also gonna become the come from um, the way you tune the drums, the choice of drums that you have, you know, whether that drum kit, the make you have and the sizes and the and the and the, the spec of that kit is correct for your sound and what you're trying to get. Alright? 
um, that you've been able to tune that, that you've been able to um, then, once it's in tune, pull using your technique the sound out of that. So these are the two things that I think make a, a, a good drummer fundamentally, is having good time and sounding good, all right? After that, there's some other things I think you would have to consider. It's been able to play in different situations. Now, there's some drummers that work and they only play one style of music, you know. So I don't think you need to be able to play every style of music. But you will have to work in the context you're in, you know. So um, you're working with other musicians. And because of that, you need to focus on working in a context that's not yours. I think so many musicians, they see the world from them themselves out and they they want the world to bend to fit into what they want. But obviously when you're a, a, a real drummer that's working, you need to fit into the context you're in. And, and one way of that is to be open and think, well, you know, let's practice the different styles of music, different fields of music. You know, let's practice playing very slow, very fast, very quiet very loud, all those types of things are something that you'd have to put into your practice routine. And then the last one, and it's, it, it's as important, is your ability to get on with people, right? Your ability to take information from other people around you, to be aware, you know, to uh, have your ears and eyes open, to be focused on what's going on. Well, the singer's having problems with that second verse. It's like um, they can't get all the lyrics in. Maybe this tempo's a little bit too fast. Maybe we need to pull the tempo down. No, excuse me, singer. You know, we just try it a little bit slower. Yeah, that, that might help me. Oh, that sounds a loads better, you know. Or, or the guitarist is not, in that riff they're trying to get isn't, isn't quite working. And I think it's because I got too many snare drum hits on here. Maybe I need to step out of the way. You know, maybe my snare drum sound is just two in the same place as the, as the guitarist. Maybe I need to tune it or play it in a different way, or maybe I won't play this backbeat. There are all of these things. Your openness, your kindness, your, your, your belief that you are a resource in the moment, in time, is so important. And if you want to be a resource in that moment, in time, which is what you want to be, that means you need to be there. So that means you need to be able to turn up on time, be ready, not mess people around, not be practicing your paradiddles while the guitarist is trying to tune their guitar. All that stuff is what makes a good drummer, okay? So, we're 12 minutes into this video and I've, I've, I hope that's been some use to uh, uh, drummers and musicians out there to go, you know, what is the job and what do I need to practice to get good at that job? But that's not what makes you great, okay? If we look at the drummers which are household names, Ringo Starr, Phil Collins, Keith Moon, John Bonham, Dave Grohl, right? With every single one of those, their personality is so important. And the way their personality works is actually different to each musician as well. I think Keith Moon is, is, is an incredible example of this. Um, he is a drummer where um, his greatness entirely comes from his individuality. He plays like nobody else. And in his case, he has had to find a band where he can operate in. Uh, and uh, with The Who, I think, those big, you know, sort of quite, almost like inaccurate chord stabs, you know, that sort of, you know, that sort of really majestic um, guitar, you know, stabs. And then, which is counterintuitive, uh, John Entwistle's exploratory bass. You would think with Keith Boone, you'd have to have a really simple bass player, but what actually you've got with The Who, is a rhythm section where they're both exploring, you know, the rhythm section is all over the place. And actually it's Pete Townsend and Roger Daltrey that are, are able to sit on top of that with these sort of just big majestic moments, you know. You, you, you don't necessarily get riffs like Led Zeppelin riffs or ACDC riffs that are locked in time. What you get is this, this incredibly driving rhythm section um, with, which is punctuated by, with, with almost orchestral stabs from Pete Townsend's guitar 
and these sort of screams and shouts from Roger Daltrey. So greatness is something else. You know, I think if Keith Moon had tried to work as a functional session drummer, he, he wouldn't got very far. So, you know, what this tells us is that greatness and goodness are actually, might not be completely mutually exclusive. There might be parts of it which are separate. You know, I'm sure they're joined in the middle. I'm sure there's certain things if we, if we looked at it, you know, there's, there's still, um, you know, uh, I think in terms of the, what did we just talk about? Time. Well, Keith Moon has to play in time somewhat, okay? <laughs> Although he's pushing it all over the place. But in terms of drum sound, his drum sound is, is absolutely beautiful and very, very important, you know, to the sound of that band. His ability to get on with the band. Well, I've <laughs> all these things is, is, is sort of almost um, contradicted by The Who. There's other bands I could pick where we go, yeah, they do that in that band, but The Who, which is probably why I, I've uh, subconsciously gone for them in this video. Questions. There's a difference, isn't there? There is. There just a, is a difference between being good and being great. Okay? I think um, when you are a good drummer, your drumming disappears. When you've got it right, your drumming disappears. You're, if you're doing everything correctly, the music should come forth. Okay? And there are many drummers around that are utter geniuses at this. They're called session drummers. And they're able to turn up and very quickly work out what's required and deliver that in a studio in one or two takes and never do anything that's in the way. If you go and check out the interview with Bernard Purdy on the Rick Beato channel, um, all the way through he keeps coming back to this. If you do this then you, you, you stay out the way and if you do this you stay out the way. So it shows that his whole concept was to get out the way and let the music shine through. When we listen to a Phil Collins, though, when we put on In The Air tonight and we hear that drum fill, he's not staying out the way. He's able to bring the drums to the fore. Great drummers, really great drummers, the legendary ones, that's what they do. Why are they able to do this? Because the music allowed them to do it. Right? There's so many faceless session drummers out there. But there's also session drummers that can do both. Now think of a drummer like Steve Gadd. Steve Gadd has played on a thousand sessions. And there's so many sessions where um, if you listen to it, he is fitting exactly in the music. But I'm pretty sure I can recognise when Steve Gadd's on a session. Right? He's been hired to some extent to put his individuality in, to some extent. Okay? And when the music requires it, Steve Gadd can turn up the individuality, you know, dial. Whether it's his, you know, opening signature drum part to 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover, or playing a two drum solos on the track Asia, which is essentially a pop song, you know, which is a song that was played on the radio. Um, there's a drummer that is able to do both. Um, Another drummer that's got an absolute signature sound for me is Vinnie Colliuta. Jaw-dropping technique, but also a really bonkers way of approaching drums. But he's earned his living playing on film soundtracks. And when he plays on the film soundtracks, and I've read interviews with, this, with him about this, he actually takes that individuality away. These, these great players are able to do both. But the drummers that are household names, they're household names because of the fact that they played in a context, usually a band, that allowed them to shine through. You know, that they, they actually played an integral part to that band sound. And I think, um, you know, in, in terms of the ones I mentioned, Dave Grohl, Phil Collins to some extent, although, you know, that track he, that I mentioned, it's his own, he's done everything on these, you know, he's written it, he's played most of the instruments, so he's able to create that space himself. John Bonham though, Ringo Starr, Keith Moon, you know, all these household name drummers. The important thing is that they are in a band 
where what they did individualistically was integ integral to the band sound. You know, um, a perfect example of this would be uh, Stuart Copeland. Stuart Copeland is a is a truly great drummer. I think, you know, in the last forty years, over forty years, he's possibly the most important drummer in terms of the history of drumming. I just cannot think of anybody that uh, that in the last forty five years has had such a in incredible influence on the way people play drums, and that's because. He had a completely unique way of playing. Now, I'm sure Stuart is such an able drummer that he can do the session job if required. But when he joined the police, the way the police sounded and the way the police were set up in terms of the way Sting's bass sound sounded and the sort of bass lines he played, in terms of, you know, uh, Andy, uh, Andy's, you know, chorusy thin guitar which actually opened up a space for the drums to come through. And, you know, I've just done a video about John Bond, talked about the same thing. You know, um, for a drummer to be truly great, he has to find that channel through the music to be great. You know, sometimes it's done because, you know, the actual, like I say, the frequency allows the drums to come through. Other times it's because there is a sort of ventilation in the music. There's, there's pockets where the drummer is allowed to suddenly shine, you know, whether it's a drum introduction or it's a certain drum fill in a certain place. Um, so the conclusion of this is that there are things that make you a good drummer and there are things that make you a great drummer. And perhaps those things aren't the same. That's the conclusion. Hope you enjoyed this video and I hope if you are a drummer, it's been a little bit useful for you in terms of uh, making you think about, you know, what you should be working on. If you are just a non-musician that loves music, you know, maybe it's helped you listen to certain drummers in another way and appreciate them in a way that might, uh, you weren't appreciating them before. Anyway, I'm finishing there. Please like the video, drop your comments, see what you think, subscribe. And also, if you want to support me doing this, become a patron. There's a whole ton of content up there you know, uh, where I get much more deeper into that and a whole bunch of other stuff. There's loads of my music there and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, please, if you get a chance, become a patron. Thanks for watching. I'll see you on the next video.